In this special inserted episode of Shaping the Future, we are discussing the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, Arctic report card that was published this week giving a detailed overview of how climate is changing in the Arctic. Zach helps to break down the complexity of this annual report and highlights some of the major impacts that climate change is bringing to the polar Arctic region. With melting sea ice, extreme wildfires and the expanding population of bowhead whales, the Arctic is a region changing before our eyes and one that has direct implications for weather patterns at lower latitudes. What is happening in the Arctic is literally the bellwether for the accelerating climate trends we see throughout the biosphere. It is also a ringing reminder for why we need to drastically cut emissions immediately and reduce atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases. Zach also gives us his personal view on whether geoengineering should be considered as a part of a wider strategy for cooling or refreezing the Arctic. Thank you for listening to Shaping the Future. The Arctic Report card is linked to in the notes below. Subscribe to the podcast on any of the main podcasting channels. Zach, thank you very much for joining me to talk about the Arctic Report card. Can you tell us first, why do we need an Arctic Report card and who does it inform? Yeah, the the purpose of the Arctic Report card is really to communicate the broad changes we're seeing in the Arctic, to provide a place where we can document all of the impacts to the earth system, to the economies of people living in the Arctic, and sort of reflect, you know, what those changes are looking like from year to year. And this particular year was actually the 15th anniversary of the Arctic Report Card, which started in 2006. And again, just to sort of address this growing need, you know, at the time, the early 2000s for to document these changes ongoing in the Arctic. And is this also building on the the fact that the Arctic really does interact with the rest of the climate system around the planet? Right, it's to document all of the components of Arctic climate change. I mean, we frequently discuss things like loss of sea ice and warming air temperatures, but there are so many other impacts and effects of Arctic climate change. So what's nice is this big report card, you know, hundreds of pages documents things like changes to wildfires or changes to like primary productivity in the oceans and whale migration. So all sorts of different impacts. And this is one place once a year where you can really document those changes. Okay, and which bit did you feed into with your work? Yeah, so I worked on sea surface temperatures. So that's that top layer, the ocean temperature, the top layer. And we're seeing, you know, when there's an increase in air temperature and when there's a loss of sea ice, of course, we can infer that there would be warming ocean temperatures at the surface. So that's what we were really trying to document in our chapter, particularly looking at what the status of those sea surface temperatures were like at the end of summer, right right around when that sea ice reaches its minimum point. And what did you find We particularly found this year really striking warmth across the ocean waters nearest Siberia. So these regions, the names are like the Loptev Sea or the Kara Sea. And again, it's just the area north of Siberia. And the region we've really been talking about all year long for having heat waves over land, lack of sea ice over the summer, And all of those feedbacks really contributed to just sort of unprecedented warmth in some of those regions in the ocean. And what is the driver of this unprecedented warmth? The fact that it's so much amplified or seemingly so? Yeah, I think you could attribute it to many things. One being, of course, the air temperature being warm and another being sea ice, the lack of sea ice. So when you have a lack of sea ice over an area during the summer, then you're going to get more incoming sunlight from the solar radiation, which then gets absorbed into the ocean, really amplifying the warmth, particularly at that surface layer in the sea surface temperature range. 
And then there's new literature and research to suggest that warmth is also coming from underneath, from the deeper ocean, and particularly looking at how warmer ocean water is transporting into the Arctic from the Atlantic Ocean. So really looking at sea surface temperatures of the Arctic Ocean, you have so many players that are causing these amplified temperatures. And I guess one more important finding is, um, this is my sort of second year involved with looking at sea surface temperatures. So I'm pretty new, at least for being part of the report card. But what we see is overall the ocean is warming from year to year gradually. But it seems each summer there's sort of a hot pocket that's really, you know, an area that's particularly striking and it, it differs from year to year. So last summer, the warmest ocean waters were sort of towards Alaska side of the Arctic and this year we're towards Siberia. But really overall, the Arctic Ocean is warming. When we talk about that warming, we talk about the sea ice extent, which this year was particularly low. Now, obviously, the extent fluctuates with the time of year, but what's happening as well with the volume of the sea ice? Yeah, that's a great question. We talk about the sea ice extent is primarily because we just have better satellite observations going back 40 years. But of course, the thickness of the ice is extremely important. And then if you take the area and multiply it by how thick it is, you get the total volume of the ice. And our observations are a bit more limited for this, but using some of our different tools we have in new satellites, we can infer that the volume of ice this year was at least the second lowest on record. And actually in October, some of the simulated observations of the volume suggested it was the lowest on record last month or two months ago now. So it's not only that this summer featured really low sea ice extent, but it was also near record low volume. Okay. And of course, when you're talking about warmer ocean waters coming into the Arctic, that's going to melt it from the bottom up as opposed to we always imagine, I suppose, from the top down. Okay. One thing that caught my attention in 2020 was these wildfires in Siberia, which kind of sounds like an oxymoron, but what is causing them and what impact are they having as we continue to warm? Right. You know, we continue, the, particularly the last few summers, we keep hearing about Siberian wildfires. And again, to note, Siberia is a really interesting place for weather. It's the most extreme place on Earth, in my view. You go from temperatures well below zero in the winter to temperatures almost 90 degrees Fahrenheit during the summertime. So huge extreme. And it's normal to have wildfires in Siberia in the summer. But what we're seeing now is just an unprecedented amount of wildfires, both in terms of the amount of the fires and sort of the area that they cover. And it's due to a couple reasons. One being the obvious one, warming temperatures, so it's, it's hotter in the summertime. But we're also seeing impacts for the soil. So we're drying out the soil and the vegetation of the region. One of the big players this summer in particular was a lack of snow in the springtime. There was just normally parts of Siberia remained snow covered into early summer. And this year, the snow melted extremely early back in the spring. Therefore, you know, allowing these soils and the vegetation to be exposed to this extreme heat that we had like in June. And that really was a contributor, I think, to the wildfires this year. And another part that the Arctic Report Card talks about is a greening of the Arctic, we call it. And what that means is now that you have, you know, a warmer climate in the Arctic, you're getting more vegetation that's growing in the Arctic and actually moving northward with time. And it's not, the rate of the amount of greening of the Arctic is not equal in all areas, but the total trend we're seeing is that there's more vegetation growing in the Arctic, which therefore more fuel for these wildfires to burn. And then the impacts of these wildfires, one I'm concerned about as a person who looks and thinks about sea ice, 
is that you get sort of all the ash and the sulfates from the wildfire smoke can actually land on top of the snow and sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. So now you have, instead of that white surface, you have this black surface, which we know that black is an absorber of heat. So that could be another additional feedback to more ice and snow melt. And, you know, that's something I think modelers are going to have a hard time simulating those types of feedbacks. But it, it's things we are definitely thinking about. How do we get better observations and model simulations of these impacts? Yeah, it's just accelerating the whole thing even more. And one of the things I read, which, which I think is pos- <laughs> it's the only positive thing I've I- imagine is the the bounce back of the bowhead whales population can you talk a bit about what's causing that but are there other species you mentioned the on land vegetation but are there other species benefiting in the sort of marine arctic world are we looking at a a wildlife haven developing is this a good thing what what sort of perspective should we take on that Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I'm not a marine biologist, but it's something I've been thinking about more recently is what are the impacts to ecosystems in the Arctic? And do we really have a good idea of how it's going to change? Uh, Yes, the the bowhead whale was, I was surprised by that finding too and found it very interesting that there's been an increase in population. And it's really due to what is the condition of the ocean waters Are they becoming more or less salty? Are they becoming warmer or colder? Of course, we know it's warmer. And how is that going to impact marine wildlife that lives in lower latitudes, maybe maybe like the Gulf of Alaska, you could think of. And now you get waters that more resemble those southern regions north into the Arctic. And what does that mean? I think, you know, it's a big open question. And I hear stories of these impacts for ecosystems. I mean, we have these indigenous communities that have been living and documenting, you know, the Arctic and their livelihoods for generations. And now they're seeing, you know, new wildlife and impacts that they've never seen before and don't know how to deal with, you know, thinking even about disease and pests moving into the Arctic, you know, how might that impact the marine and land ecosystems? are all really questions we should be thinking about for sure. And the Arctic report card is really a great place to think about these questions and document these changes, like in the whale population or the walrus population. The walrus community is another population that's really being well documented by people who live in Alaska. The lack of sea ice, particularly in a few winters recently, has dramatically impacted where the walrus have been found, which of course are very important for indigenous communities. So you raise a great point. And I think, I know I am, but I think a lot of people are going to be thinking about what really are the impacts to ecosystems from this dramatic warming. Yeah and obviously this report card covers so many areas in in a lot of depth and when you read it or any part of it what strikes you or what concerns you the most that you would say to a policymaker you know we really need to keep an eye on this this is the what I'm (laughs) worrying about. Right I I think you know, so the purpose of the Arctic Report Card is really to provide, you know, documentation of these changes. Um, and it, less so, it doesn't really discuss, you know, why we're getting these changes. That's sort of left for other research outlets. So when I think about, you know, what the Arctic Report Card is doing in documenting these changes, I like to think about how it's progressed over time. So I thought, particularly for me, one of the most striking chapters was actually the reflection chapter. So I said this was the 15th year anniversary of the R2 report card, and there is an essay in it reflecting on what was documented in the first report card in 2006. And, you know, I've talked, I think even with you in the past, that our climate models from decades ago knew or showed that the Arctic was gonna warm faster than the rest of the planet. But even back in the 90s and 2000s, we were starting to see changes to sea ice and warming temperatures, but there was just not a general consensus on how bad it's going to get or why it's going to get this way. And that essay, you know, reflecting on the Arctic Report Card discusses that like back in 2006, we were really starting to see some significant changes, but 
we still didn't have, I think, the confidence we have today about how severe these changes are happening in the Arctic and how bad it might get in the future. So to me, that, that's what I like to reflect on, you know, our new knowledge that we've gained over the last 10 to 20 years about the Arctic and what changes we've already seen, what has surprised us, what has not surprised us. That's mm-hmm. really striking to me. And another interesting note, you know, in 2006, when they said, you know, we were still a little more uncertain, the next summer in 2007 was an unprecedented sea ice year. At the time, that dropped to the lowest year on record. And I think took a lot of scientists by surprise how low the summer 2007 sea ice actually got. And it was kind of one of the first big wake up calls to the changes in the Arctic. So if I were to talk to policymakers, and if I had the time, I would show them subsets of the progress and evolution of the Arctic report cards over the last decade. Okay, and it's amazing in that time, actually, the acceleration of change. Year on year, it seems to be accelerating. So we're right in the throes of it. Can I ask you, given the rate of emissions reduction that we're talking about in international climate negotiations, Do you think they're going to impact the warming trend we're witnessing? Are they enough to to turn that around? Or is the Arctic trend set? Right. And the Arctic trend is not set. We still have a significant opportunity to reduce the amount of future warming and impacts that the Arctic experiences. You know, I keep saying we know that the Arctic is going to warm faster than the rest of the planet. But the amount of warming, even though it's greater, that uncertainty in the amount is huge, which suggests that we really have an opportunity to limit that upper amount of warming that the Arctic could experience. So I am still optimistic that the worst of the impacts of Arctic climate change, you know, we can still prevent not experience. So to me, that's an optimistic point. One point I also try to make is when we talk about like the Paris Climate Treaty of reducing the global temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2 degrees Celsius. That's a global average. So the Arctic is going to warm faster or more than 2 degrees Celsius um, above that. And as someone concerned about Arctic climate change, I try to make that point is that 2 degrees is a global average. yeah. There are areas that are going to warm a lot more than two degrees, the Arctic being one. And to think about that is when we're thinking about future evidence-based policies for climate changes, to consider that some regions will warm faster and some areas will warm slower than others. And what are the impacts of those areas? One of the areas that gets talked about a lot in terms of targets for emissions reduction, I know this is a sort of different subject, but uh, there's a lot of negative emissions technologies assumed in those numbers. And I've also heard quite a lot of talk around ambitions to intervene and cool the Arctic with geoengineering. Is this something you would say is possible, this this idea to refreeze the Arctic, given the scale of the region and the size of the task? Is this something you would say, yeah, you know, we could, we could have a crack at that? Uh, admittedly, my personal view is skeptical about geoengineering. So my background is in meteorology and the thinking about weather forecasts. And I know that the atmosphere is just chaos. There's so much noise in the atmosphere. And that's why the weather is unpredictable. You know, beyond a week, we still can't really predict whether it's going to rain at your house or not. So for me, thinking about modifying, you know, the atmosphere affecting chaos and weather is is scary. However, I think it's an important area to research. And I strongly encourage, you know, the people who are working on these topics to research the impacts of geoengineering more and more. So I think that's an important point. I'm not an expert on energy solutions, but I I think a solution to climate change is going to involve many solutions. It's really a portfolio of answers to solving, and there is no one right answer. So I'm open, you know, to evidence-based policies that consider different solutions. And more and more research, I always encourage, especially for a topic like geoengineering. So you say definitely don't take it off the table, but do the research. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Well, that's a, that's a great place 
to end, I think you've given us quite a bit of insight into to what this report is. Obviously, we'll link to it in the post notes. So thank you very much. It's always good to speak to you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you.